What's up everybody? Welcome back to the Shop Mini RC. I'm Ken and today we've got a real game changer. Look at this guy. This is the Fury Wagon, the FX 118. You can see it written right there. This guy is the first 118 scale, small scale, any small scale really, but this guy's a 118 scale, first 118 scale brushless system ready to run. Right out the box, you're ready to go plug in the battery, add batteries to your remote, and uh, you're going brushless. This thing is awesome. Um, I'm sure you've seen some of the other review videos out there. They're not wrong. All the guys that say this thing is a beast, they are not wrong. Um, we're going to dive into it. We are taking ours to Proline by the Fire this week, uh, so you'll probably have that footage in this video. And um, yeah, but I want to go ahead and dive into it now. We just got back from a four-week trip in florida dealing with non-rc stuff for four weeks and uh this guy was just waiting for us to get home and so yeah we've really anticipated this release for months we've been working with fear tech for months on this guy um we've had some inside information we gave feedback on it early on um dare i even say the name might have come from some suggestions we had there were a lot of names bouncing around and uh, some very bad some very good uh, this is where they landed though, so we're, we're okay with that. And um, I think we even suggested they shorten the bed on this guy. We'll compare it to the um, the Hobby Plus CR18P Evo Harvest, which is what this is kind of based on. At least the body is definitely based on it underneath. It's still some Hobby Plus stuff, but it's, it's uh, improved. Let's just say that. So uh, yeah, let's go ahead and dive into it and uh, check it out. And we'll kind of compare and contrast and I'll... Uh, talk about some of the key features and then we'll do some running video and yeah, should be a good time. Let's go. All right, guys. So let's dive into this guy. Guess we can start with the body. This is a Lexan body. Comes in three different, four different colors, excuse me. Comes in a green, a red, and then a black flame and a blue flame. You can see all those. Um, the black and the blue versions with the flames have blacked out windows. The green and the red have the cleared windows. They have working lights up at the top here. This light bar is all wired up and you've got lights there. So that's pretty slick. Uh, it is held on by body posts and clips. Um, let's go ahead and compare this while we have it to the CR18P Harvest. Here's the Harvest. Go ahead and pull this one off. Our Harvest took a uh, pretty beastly tumble and we lost one of our, our lenses. The difference between the Harvest and the Fury Wagon is that the Harvest has headlights and taillights and those are lit. Whereas the Fury Wagon is more just the uh, light bar here. But if you do have the Harvest, you could probably work these lights on in some way. Maybe put them here on the sides so they stick out the sides. Uh, and then get your taillights on there. Maybe in a horizontal fashion instead of the vertical fashion here. That would be pretty cool. We might end up doing that if we reuse this body. Or maybe we'll trim this body down and add the light bars here and throw that on. I don't know. I don't know what we're doing. We're probably going to keep it stock for a while um, because <laughs> from my experience we probably won't need to change much add a little weight maybe move where some of the stuff is and you're gonna get a pretty pretty nutso comp quality rig um, so again if you really wanted to go crazy comp you would probably remove the whole cage and light bar just to lighten it up um, so at that point you don't want any lights on it but the way it comes it is uh, very cool that they at least included some lights and the light bar, which is pretty awesome because, like I said, if you have the other one, you can swap things around and get a ton of lights on a rig if you really wanted to. I also love the decals. It's paying some homage to the Hobby Plus brand because, again, a lot of this platform is based on Hobby Plus. And, uh, yeah, the, the quality of the paint is very good. I mean, you can see it's got sparkles in it. It's all white-backed. I mean, it, it it's not super thin Lexan. It's got some thick thickness to it so that's it's a pretty strong Lexan which I really like the beds painted matte black so that looks good on the Evo 
doesn't have the matte black, though it does have the matte fenders and the fender board. But this is a different mold. You can see it's a different mold for a few different reasons. One, that line that goes across the bed on the bottom is actually not there at all. It's not like they just cut it off. It's actually completely not there. Um, the fenders are curved, so they're not just cut off. They are molded and curved. And then, like I said at the beginning, the length is just a bit less. It's trimmed down. That's because when we have the bed like this, just kind of a, a, a thinner cop style, no fender bed, it was very long. And that hurt your uh, departure angle, right? You got your truck on there. You're going up. You're going to hit much sooner as you're, you're going to catch on more rocks. Yeah, just not ideal. So trim that back, shorten the bed up a little bit. Helps the weight bias to the front just a, a little bit, not much at all, but just a little bit. And then more importantly, clears up your departure angle a ton. So you got really good departure angle on this and a really good approach angle as well. Look at that approach angle, boom, pretty nuts. All right, so that's the body. Moving on to the rig itself. Look at that, right there, smack dab in the middle, boom. This is the new Venom motor. And paired with that Venom motor is the ESC and receiver. This ESC is the Lizard Pro with the Bluetooth built in. And then this receiver, it is this guy here. It's a Flysky FSR4P BS. And that is this transmitter. So a lot of us that have used the other FCX, FMS products or Hobby Plus products are familiar with this transmitter. It comes with the dip switches to change your drag brake, um, your LiPo versus nickel metal. Not that you'd ever really run nickel metal in these, but you could, um, but basically puts LiPo cutoff on and then, which you're not gonna actually use because you're gonna set that in here, um, but then also gives you your drive mode. So forward, reverse, um, all that good stuff. Now. Having set all that, all those settings are actually set through this right here. They're set through your ESC and your Bluetooth on the app. Uh, so I don't even know if these switches actually do anything on this version. Um, we'll have to look at that. But your forward and reverse definitely here for your servo and your uh, steer or your throttle, and then all of your uh, trims and uh, dual rates for your channel one and channel two. Okay your steering and your throttle trims. You have a channel three here, which is a three position. And then you have a momentary channel four. And this uses triple A's. Now back on this guy, the Venom uh, is basically a micro Komodo. So the proven and most popular micro Komodo brushless outrunner motor is what you've got here. It's just called the Venom. I think they did some cost saving uh, measures, uh, just the way it's finished, the way the machining is. I think that's what they basically changed to reduce the cost on this guy just a little bit. And then the, uh, the Lizard Pro paired up with that is just a beast of a system. We are on a um, the transmission from the Evo, except they think they've just basically locked it out into a single speed. Here's the Evo, and you can see the transmission there. They're basically the exact same transmission housings, um, just don't have the... Uh, the shift servo in there it would go right below this right where this battery is at basically um we're gonna have to open that up i'm curious if all the mechanics are in there for it to shift or if it's just locked and the gears are removed it could be so it could be just locked and if you uh pop stuff around and move things out you can just add a shift servo and then it shifts if all the gears and everything there or they completely removed all the gearbox and shift fork and all that stuff and then um yeah you'll have to Change things around quite a bit to get it to work. It actually looks, let's see here. Hmm. I can't tell. I think the shift rod is not there at all. So maybe you can just add a shift rod and shift fork and it'll work. We'll have to look. We'll open it up. Um, the chassis rails are Furitech aluminum with the nice edging. Uh, tons of shock mounting positions. Pretty sweet there. Uh, definitely a lot more tunable than the original. And then if you notice, it looks like this guy skipped leg day <laughs> compared to the uh, the Fury Wagon. This FX118 platform 
is using oil-filled aluminum cap shocks and boy do they feel good they are smooth so i definitely dig that they are the larger bore and oil filled which is pretty awesome um let's go underneath here same skid plate same transmission housing same links uh the drive shaft this looks like they've got silver aluminum ball joints in the drive shaft and these guys while i believe they're still metal they're not uh they're not silver they're black okay the drive shafts themselves are not metal though and they are not metal on here either um an interesting note though look at the way the drive shaft is the split drive shaft here and i think that's because they knew we were going to have a lot more articulation and so maybe they needed more space i'm not sure why they chose to go that route though a two-piece drive shaft in the rear um and then the front drive shaft is also a little different it looks a little beefier actually and it looks a little shorter so i don't know what's going on there that's interesting because these lengths should be the same the the transmission to the axle should be the same length let's look maybe it's an optical illusion so this guy looks like it's going to be right about 37 millimeters and this guy yeah, also 37 millimeters. Huh, I guess it's just an optical illusion because this guy is more beefy. It's got much more beefs. I think it's also the way the output shaft side is longer. This guy is shorter. So that's a much longer piece, which shortened up the shaft quite a bit. The, the I don't know what you call these, the flanges, the, the whatever. <laughs> the fingers, they basically are they're much longer versus on this guy here. This guy has a lot more natural drag brake. Um, another thing of notice is that this is much louder. And it is much louder because it's all metal gears, guys. Everything, all gears in this are metal. The portal gears and the transmission gears, completely metal. So on that note, my guess is the two-speed stuff is not in there at all, but the housing is there, so that's nice. If you ever wanted to try to convert it over, you just need the gears and shift, but we'll open it up and we'll verify. Um, our steering links, they are just typical plastic steering links, but compared to the Evo, this is servo on axle versus servo on chassis. From a performance standpoint, you want servo on axle. It helps add weight to the axle. So non-rotating um, unsprung weight, which is good. Whereas on the chassis, you have the weight on the chassis, which is sprung weight, which is worse for your body roll and things like that, your center of gravity. It also means that when you have servo on uh, chassis, you have to have a traction bar to prevent your axle from moving while you're trying to steer or when you compress uh, keeping your axle centered and stuff. So that's what this guy here is. It's a traction bar. So servo on axle prevents all that. So it's a much more performance oriented uh, orientation. And um, yeah, this guy runs on portals, which is pretty sweet. Uh, this bump, you know, it's interesting. Look at this. The power wagon or the um, Fury wagon and the Harvest. The Fury wagon is a more narrow body with no fenders, but has this larger bumper. Although there's still plenty of front clearance, like I showed, it is a larger front bumper. You don't rub it all. There's plenty of clearance there. Oh, a little bit of rubbing, actually. I'm pushing really hard, though. Oh, no. Yeah, you're under normal compression, there's, there's no rubbing. Um, however, on the Harvest, it's got this little stubby bumper, which is interesting. So I think I might end up swapping these bumpers around so that this gets the longer bumper and this guy will get the stubby bumper. We'll probably do that um, as long as everything mounts up like it's supposed to, which it looks like it should. It's close. Um, we'll have to look. We'll have to see. Maybe it won't. I don't know. I'll do another video on that. Maybe I'll show it in this video. I don't know. We'll see. I don't want this one to be too long. All right, guys. What else do we have? The body mounts can be raised and lowered. I actually think that we have plenty of room to lower this body just a little more if we wanted to lower the body just a little. 
you have plenty of room from a clearance standpoint when it comes to the wheels and tires, you're not going to be hitting the body. So you could lower it a little bit if you'd like. And uh, you might just have to trim this front piece because this is riding right on the, on the frame rails. But you can go down probably another hole on the front and rear. All right. As I said, all metal gears in the portals, in the pumpkins, and in the transmission. Uh, these wheels and tires, they're pretty good as far as the tires are concerned. They've, they've got some stickiness. You know, they're, they're really soft compound. They're 1.3s uh, to make sure that they can clear the portals. So just be aware if you're going to be change, putting aftermarket wheels on the Fury wagon or the 118 platform. Um, Make sure you're you're gonna have to be careful that some 1.0s will work, some 1.0s will not work, some will rub. So just be aware of that. Make sure they're compatible with uh, the portals, basically like an FCX24 or the CR18P. Uh, any 1.0s that state they work with those should have no problem working on here. Um, but yeah, they are 1.2s, and there are some good 1.2 wheels and tires out there. So definitely check out some of the ones that are out there that are specifically 1.2s. They'll, they'll definitely help with performance. Um, what else do we get going on here? One thing I noticed is that the shocks, because they're the big bores, they have to have these standoffs as opposed to the shorter standoffs here, right? And that helps push the shocks out just a little bit more to give clearance because they are a much larger diameter, but they do have plenty of clearance there. They don't rub anywhere. It's perfect. So I definitely like that. It also means there's more parts options out there for people that are trying to upgrade the Evos or change things around. Having these standoffs, good, very good. Now, when it comes down to the steering, our steering angle on this guy is pretty good. They mention it's a 45 degree steering angle. So that's awesome. You can see it's it's got a pretty dang good steering angle right there. And I'm sure there's going to be some minor things you could do to kind of improve that if you want to get a little bit more, but that's pretty good already. I do like that it's a four link here. It's not a three link. It's a full true four link suspension, which is awesome. It helps with the stability. And then we'll go to this battery here. The battery is a 600 milliamp 2S LiPo um, and it runs the Molex uh, 51005 con connector, also known as a low C connector. Okay. That guy there is pretty common in a lot of the Hobby Plus stuff. So it makes sense that it would be used here. You can easily change out this connector here to any of the other FearTech adapters if you wanted to use uh, a different plug or different battery. They basically have adapters you can just plug in here and change your end to like an SCX adapter battery plug or whatever. Um, you can also make adapters or just cut this and make your own if you wanted to switch to a different battery. But this is a great battery. It's great for longer runs. I mean, 600 milliamps is, huh, you're going to be running for a while. Another thing, this all should be 3S capable if I'm not, you know, mistaken. This is a, this is definitely 3S capable. The Lizard Pro is a 3S capable ESC. Um, I'm not 100% sure on this. I'll check. I'll, I'll put a note in the video, but I am pretty sure this is going to be 3S capable. Also, if you are curious, this guy is a 3,450 kV motor. So you've got some good wheel speed there. Let's go ahead and turn this guy on real quick. And look at this nutty, nutty slow crawl, guys. I mean, I'm barely giving it throttle. Plenty of wheel speed. So pretty, pretty sick little setup for a ready to run, guys. Remember, this is a ready to run brushless for under $200. It's $199. That is nutty, guys. I don't know. I mean, it's, I'll just put it this way. It's sad. Well, I'm happy, but it's sad that it took this long for a company to come out with a brushless RTR for the minis. And, you know, I'm surprised the big names have not done it or did not do it. They didn't even approach it, it seems like. So the fact that FearTech stepped up to the plate uh, makes this a game changer. I think they're going to push the other brands to have to answer. They're going to have to respond. The big brands are going to have to figure out a brushless system that they can get out there for under $200.
Um, you know, the big T word brand, they'll probably charge you 250 for it with a brushless in there. But man, remember where it started. FureTech brought the first brushless mini RTR to market for under $200. I mean, that's just sick. And remember, it's a it's a FureTech system. It's proven. It's got such good slow crawl and just the performance in general of the electronics is top notch. Fantastic. It's been out for, you know, two, three years at least now. Um, so they have a proven brushless micro system, which is which is awesome. Um, before we dive into this guy and take things apart, I just want to talk about some things that I think you could probably do to increase the performance. I think right now it sits at like 4951 weight distribution. So 49% to the back, 51 to the front, which is great for like a trail rig, right? It's pretty balanced. Uh, you have a little bit of front bias, but not much. But I think for a hardcore comp crawler where you're trying to crawl walls, you definitely need a 60, 40 weight bias. And I think that can be easily achieved with this guy. Look how much space we have up in the front. And when you compress the servo, you still have a lot of space up here. So somebody should probably print a, a tray here. Let's get this out of here real quick. For some smaller batteries, you can even use this one, but imagine just a smaller battery, how easily it can fit right here. And you'd still have tons of space and below the body. I mean, the body is, it's you got like this much space. You could have it mounted all the way up here if you wanted, but you want it as low as possible. So if somebody made a mount that like gave us a four, even all the way up to here, right? You could have it mounted all the way up to the front as low as possible and it'd sit right about there. That could be a really good battery position and just mount it right here at the chassis and you're clear of your, your outrunner. You have a ton of forward weight bias and then you can even move all your electronics up to here, which pushes everything forward even more. So that could be pretty awesome. Also, somebody I'm sure is gonna come out with, if not already, um, some sky, side skids and you can mount all your electronics and your battery on your side skids. That way it's low and uh, forward. That would be fantastic as well. Um, one of the things that I do not like about this chassis and others have pointed out already is how long this section is. I kind of wish that the design of this was just a little different. I know Gammy RC worked with this a little bit uh, because he works with FuraTech. He's one of the designers, but they could have easily trimmed this back quite a bit. I mean, you could bring this chassis theoretically all the way back to like right in here, right? And then just, just have it come right through here, clear all this space in here, and then you just have longer upper links. I know they're probably trying to use the Hobby Plus upper links, but if they would have just added another set of links, um, you know, to their manufacturing process, I don't know if these are any longer. These are probably the longest other than these, but I'm sure there's some other links or aftermarket links and you can run just a much longer link all the way to here, right? There's plenty of clearance in there. So it looks like a link could go all the way back to here and then you trim all this off, basically clearing all this up. Um, you just don't want to make too much of a weak point right in here, but still, even if you went from here all the way down and around, and kind of stair-stepped it that would clear all this because this stuff gets hung up on rocks very easily and even here let's see yeah it looks like there's plenty of room in there again this is just my initial impressions they could have cut this all the way back to here use a little bit longer links and put your link mounting points in here um and yeah and had this all the way cut all the way back because really you only need it to where the belly plate sits right so here and here, if you have a place to mount your links, you just got to find a place to mount your links. So you'll need longer links. But I think that would be um, an upgrade chassis, you know, and they'll probably offer some upgraded chassis like that and link sets or somebody will uh, just to get this guy more narrow. So you're not catching on stuff. You know, when these compress, you're still pretty much, if you're just have a flat plane, right? as a perfectly flat rock and you're coming up and over the rock, you're not going to really rub on these. They're not an issue in that regard because you're going to be hitting your links still right maybe just a little bit here which you could trim that but the problem is that's not real life real life is when you're crawling you're going sideways over things these are definitely catching that extra width you're definitely hitting on that stuff um, and if you had side uh, sliders you're going to hit on those as well um, but maybe sliders would help having them further out and angled like kind of boat sliders not crazy angled but just a little bit help kind of keep you from just getting caught but that's that's it. Other than that, 
I really like the design. I, uh, I just kind of wish the battery had a, a mount offered that was for the a forward mount on the battery and that these were a little, little shorter in here. Other than that, everything on this thing is pretty top notch. All the shock mounting positions, fantastic. It's a great little setup for sure. I love it. It's quality. That's the other thing. You got to remember, guys, it's, I feel like I'm looking at like a $250 plus truck, right? Like if you were to build this yourself, I mean, here, I'm going to put up this. So look at this, guys. The truck itself, a regular CR18P truck, not the Evo, a regular one, is $140. Then you have the Furitech, the Lizard Pro, that's going to be $65. Let's say the Venom is only $30. That's way cheaper than a Micro Komodo. Let's just say it's $30. Bucks. Then you have a $15 external receiver, you know, just on average, 15 bucks for a receiver. Um, you know, and that's not including the remote. So you'd have to have your own remote, but a $15 receiver, uh, aluminum shocks are 20 bucks. The aluminum frame is 35, just that alone, right? Just those upgrades. If you were to call this an upgrade, the brushless system an upgrade and the remote and the shocks that alone, you're at $305 for this setup guys, $305. So <laughs> It's a killer deal, guys. You gotta think of it like this. This is Furitech's first push into a ready-to-run, like a full-blown ready-to-run, other than the Cayman, right? The Cayman is it was kind of a custom build thing, and that's why they were pricey. They were like $380 for a Cayman 360, depending on if it was six by six or the four by four. Um, and it was kind of an amalgamation of different parts from different manufacturers. And you know, th this is really a true ready-to-run mass production style. And um, they're probably breaking even on this guy. I wouldn't be surprised if they're just barely breaking even, just enough to get it you know, pushed out there and get the name out there and get something to market to help kind of ooh and awe the masses on the Fear Tech brand. And I think they're, they're, they're killing it. You know, it's kind of like Sony and Microsoft and, you know, with Xboxes and Playstations, they, they basically sell the Xbox or Playstation, the main platform at a loss. Uh, just to get it out there and get it into people's hands so that people then will want to use more of those products that are compatible with the Xbox or PlayStation. I think the same thing's happening here where FearTech is pretty much just washing it clean, breaking even, but trying to get something awesome to us. So take advantage of this, guys. Um, one thing we need to touch on is the servo. I'm not sure on where the servo is from, the brand of servo, anything like that. Um, but in my limited testing, it seemed to have plenty of power. I mean, let's plug this guy in. I'll show you. Put it back in here real quick. Don't forget, you can turn up your BEC on this guy. And I believe I was told you can put this at 8.4 volts. Um, I do kind of wish this battery holder was a little different. I kind of like a single band in the middle versus two. This two is annoying, but whatever. All right, there we go. It seems good, guys. The servo seems good. I'm not sure if it's Metal Gear or not, um, but it's definitely responsive, definitely has power. Wanted to see, where's my other phone at? Hold on. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna get on the app here real quick. Let's make sure we're on the most recent update. Looks like we are. 2.24, is that right? Yeah, 2.24. Yeah, the way they do their updates here is kind of weird. 2.3, 2.6. Yeah, these are these are the most recent. 2.24. We'll go ahead and update that. All right. Set to the Venom, which is good. Improved power for the Venom motor. All right. Okay, so. I have a full video on this app. So you can check it out over here, um, but I'm just going to kind of check some stuff. No low voltage cutoff. We always want to set that to like 3.3-ish. Um, again, you can change your servo output to 6.5. Let's try it. Yes. 
Oh, you can hear the difference. It definitely has more power. A little bit higher pitched on the 6.5. A little bit more responsive too. All right, we're gonna leave it on five for now, but if you ever needed to, you're in a comp crawl situation, pump it up to the 6.5 for that run, you'll probably be fine. Uh, you can set all of your different settings here. Your throttle, telemetry, all that. Uh, you can calibrate. Looks like we're gonna go ahead and recalibrate this guy actually. Set zero speed, okay. Set max speed, okay. Set max reverse, okay. That's odd. It looked like it was showing both. As reverse, that was interesting. Ah, let's try to reverse this. There we go. Interesting. Either way, you're probably good to go out the box. This is just some stuff you can mess with, throttle curve, all that good stuff. Check out the app uh, video that I have over there for sure. And yeah, get into it. Man, so good. It's like a little bug. I love it. Creepy crawler. All right, guys, let's go ahead and um, I guess we'll dive into it. We're going to start taking this thing apart. All right, let's dive into this guy. I guess we will start with the... Wheels and tires, we'll take those off. And then uh, we'll probably dive into this axle and the shocks. So the wheels have these little plastic hub covers, which is pretty cool. You should just be able to take them off by hand. Worst case, you can probably use a larger uh, like nut driver. Yeah, there we go. And that'll pull that plastic outer piece off. or at least loosen it so you can do it by hand. And then, should be able to, hmm, let's be a five millimeter, which we don't have right now. We'll just use this here. I do like that these wheels are actual bead locks. They're not like glue-ons, like the Traxxas is, a, is you glue them on. They're not even glued from the factory, so they, they will just slide sometimes. But these guys are actual bead locks. You know, I'm curious. Oh, they even have, so they everything here now has hex screws. Every single part of the truck. There is not a single Phillips head screw on here that I have found. I've looked it over, so. If we come across one, I'll let you know. But as far as I can tell, every single screw is a hex head, which is awesome. Right, let's get this guy apart. There's our front, our rear, our inner, and then, yep, there's foams in there. So that's the setup there, which means there's gonna be brass inserts you can use if you wanna use the stock wheels. Um, and uh, yeah, you can swap over to any tires you want using the stock wheels or use your stock tires on aftermarket wheels, unlike some of the other brands that make you buy proprietary wheels or proprietary tires. Um, again, 1.2s will fit. You know, and honestly, you could probably fit some 1.0s. One second. All right, let's see here. So they're a little, a little, little wide. They get widened up, but you can see these are 1.0 tires. No, this is going to be bad on your side hilling. Um, but they definitely look beefy, right? These are the Enjoras. These guys here, you're curious. The Enjora 58 millimeters. But yeah, you could do that. And you could probably, well, I don't think you can put 1.0 wheels on these guys. Uh, that wouldn't work so well. But if you do want to change your tires, and you want to go with 1.0s, some of them will fit just fine. You could even cut the wheels or the tire beads off, um, and that'll make it not so puffy, if you will, or sloppy side to side. 
So you can make it work. It's always about, about getting creative, um, trying things out. If we really wanted to run these on here, we'd probably just trim the beat off. Super simple. We've done it on, you know, people do it all the time for the 1.8s, the big supers or the outlaws. And you'll just take a large diameter tire and you trim the bead out so that you can fit it onto a larger diameter wheel without actually having the tire fold, right? Because the problem is the tire folds like this when you pull it out. So if you just were to flip this guy inside out, you'd be able to trim it. Again, that's not what this video is about, so sorry. But you could easily just go, bink, flip this guy around, trim that bead off super easily, and then it'll fit much better on the 1.2 wheels. All right, let's get back to the truck. Sorry for that little tire, tire segment, if you will. Good thing we have chapters down below. All right, we get this uh, tire back together and we'll dive into these portals and the diff. All right, let's get at this portal here. Pull our little hex off, boom. Don't lose your axle pin. Wow, these are actually very small axle pins. These almost look like they're thinner than the SCX. 24 axle pins. Where did it go? Oh, it's stuck to the end of my screwdriver. <laughs> yeah, these are very, very, very thin, which is fine, so long as they don't break under major stress, but they should be fine. Um, these, I've never seen an axle pin bend or break on these little guys, so I'm not worried about that at all. All right, so there's our shaft. They are greased up in there, so that's good. Lots of grease. Um, one thing of note, these are all bushings. So while bushings are great for people that like to run in the water and run in the mud because your bearings will rust, Bush, bushings um, don't rust because they're brass. But um, the problem is you're not going to be running this guy really in mud and water with an outrunner motor because these don't really do well in the water and in the mud and in the dirt. Um, well, dirt's fine as long as you're not getting tons of dirt up in there running it through mud, but like you really don't want to run through the water. So the bushings, this is something that definitely could be upgraded here. Don't lose any of your little shaft pins, your, your axle pins. But yeah, you can see, showing you guys, it's all metal, all metal gears, showing you how they're built. Easy to upgrade. Hopefully we see some overdrive or underdrive portal gears. That would be nice. Um, or maybe underdrive or overdrive diff gears. That could be nice as well. Either one or both. Giving us the options would be super nice. Okay, go ahead and throw this guy back together and then we'll visit this diff cover. I do want to remind you, because I don't know who's watching the video, if you're experienced or maybe if this is your first ever RC, don't over tighten any of this stuff. Never over tighten. Uh, whenever you're going plastic into plastic, just tighten it up until it's nice and snug. If you're going metal, end up, you're in a metal screw into a metal part, um, you can always use lat Loctite. Um, that way you don't have to over tighten and strip a screw or break a screw head off. Um, never use Loctite into plastic though, unless it's plastic safe Loctite, because Loctite will degrade plastic. Another thing I wanted to note on these axles that I really like about the design is these portal housings, the portal cases, portal boxes. Um, there's two screws on the inside when you pull everything out. I failed to show you, sorry. But there's two screws here and here. And you can see where they screw into the axle here. That's where your portal box goes on or your C-hub goes on. So your front and your rear axle housings are the same, which is awesome. It also means that you know there could be future offerings or modifications where people just do straight axles. If they wanna have more of a narrow um, wheelbase for more of a scale build, you can narrow up the wheelbase by just putting you know, some end caps on for straight axles, different axle shafts, and then on the front, some smaller C-hubs. Um, and yeah, you'd have a straight axle setup versus a portal setup, which is really awesome that uh, these axles are going to be modular like that. Now, whether that stuff ever comes, who knows? Hopefully some aftermarket guys jump on that and produce something because I know there's guys out there that want more scale type builds. 
and maybe even more narrow axles so they can fit smaller bodies on more of a 20th scale or 24th scale body um, so that would be super nice you know there are a lot of portal housings where the portals are built in or you can't remove um, the portal box from the axle housing at least the inner portion and so yeah it's nice that you're able to do that also these diff covers are removable obviously which is nice i've seen a lot of portal um, axles where the way the diff cover is set up or the axle splits you have to split the axle in half and you have to take a bunch apart to get to your diff versus just pulling a diff cover off so it's super cool that we can just pull the diff cover off without having to completely disassemble the rear axle and take it apart in two halves you know um, this is very convenient for you know maintenance purposes changing your oils and greases and whatnot So you can see there's plenty of grease in that diff cover. There's even more on the gear itself. Again, bushings, which is not a big deal, but you can see, I don't know if you can see it back there. I can see back there. That pinion is metal. This ring is metal. All metal, guys. So that is freaking sweet. A lot of the ready-to-runs are not metal gears like that. You know, they, they, they've got plastic gears in a lot of places. So... I am super happy to see and verify for you that everything is metal in here. We're going to go ahead and look at the shock next, and then I guess we'll pull the transmission apart. All right, and on to the shock. So I'm going to pull this whole thing apart because I want to, I want to look at kind of the, I'm going to measure the length too. Just want to pop this guy out. Let's see if we can just rotate this. There we go. That's a very cool piece of hardware right there. Just wanted to show you. It's basically a double ball joint with a, a nice standoff on there and it looks pretty solid. So I don't think there's gonna be is any issues breaking there. The only concern I would have with anything ever breaking would be its mount to the axle. If anything was gonna break, it'd be that or a link potentially. But again, these are pretty stout. So I'm not really worried about that. I have actually seen some guys do some crazy 3D printed stuff where they'll put an extra, you know, cover or mount piece on top of this and give themselves a separate shock mount or a dual shock mount for the monster trucks. So you can have your link go into this with just a regular ball joint or screw, and then your shocks will be mounted actually on top on the axle with multiple mounting positions and stuff like that. So you can change where it mounts on the actual axle housing as well. Um, all right, so this top one, Looks like we actually have a nut on here. Yep, so let's get some needle nose. And we'll unscrew this guy here. And this has kind of an interesting little standoff ball joint. So if you're gonna do some aftermarket shocks, you're gonna to need to make sure that you can either space those shocks or this ball joint fits. Um, let's see the best way to get this out of here. You're probably going to want to use some sort of driver that you can, there you go, like push through. Just be careful you don't break the shock. There we go. And there's our joint. So that's an interesting little joint. Here's our shock. Let's take this guy apart and see what it's about. There's our oil. Definitely oil filled. Ooh, look at that. We even have a bladder. So I don't know if you can see that, but there's a little rubber bladder in there which is freaking awesome it helps prevent cavitation and not smooth operation of the shock so that's sweet and it looks like this is, is this independent of that can you pop this out i don't know if you can pop the plastic eyelet out oh it looks like it might just unscrew i have grease on my hand or oil on my hands now so of course it's gonna be hard to get out there we go there we go so there's our bladder, there's our top eyelet, 
our top shock. Uh, where did our shock go? Here we go. We have an aluminum collar here. I'm not sure the weight that's on here, but I'm sure we can figure it out. I wanted to see what... Looks like we have a Jesus clip or C or E clip that's in there. So what we'll have to do, we're gonna have to hold on to this guy here and see if we can unscrew our eyelet. Actually, give me one second, let's see. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna use a paper towel here, wrap it around our shock shaft so that I can hold it without marring it up. Then we'll unscrew our eyelet. There we go. So it's definitely just tight. Just got to be careful not to mar up the shaft, obviously. All right, let's go ahead and push this guy out. I try to avoid losing oil. So it looks like we have an actual like uh, bushing or valve that's got the tiny holes in it on the sides so that the oil can push through. Um, so that's good. It's not just a C-clip. Sometimes it's just a C-clip in these oil-filled shocks and it's not enough to kind of seal the actual uh, shock housing. And so the oil just kind of passes very freely by the C-clip. So this is a much better design. The fact that it's got an actual, it's got two C-clips, one on each side it looks like, and then an actual valve bushing, I guess. I don't know what you call it. Oh, we're losing all of our oil. Um, this should be 200 weight is my guess, 200 weight oil. And then of course in here, you're going to have a bushing or O-ring on each side. Maybe just one. Nope, there are two in there. So it goes bushing or O-ring, bushing, O-ring. All right, there you go. So O-ring bushing, O-ring, all right? And now that we've made a mess and lost all of our shock oil, we'll put her back together. So I went in and used this low C shock oil. It's uh, 20 weight, 200, well, 195 CST. I said 200 weight earlier, I meant 20 weight. Uh, 20 weight or 195 CST, you can also get 200 CST, but this is kind of what I've been using in a lot of my stuff. So that's what I'm going to use here. And I'm pretty sure that's the same as what they're putting in here. I think they're putting 20 weight to 200. So it's basically the same. You want to kind of fill it all the way up. Make sure that, you know, when you drop down, you fill it up. Don't fill it all the way when it's uh, extended because then you'll just spill a bunch. But go ahead and try to get it kind of a nice little level amount. And then uh, we'll go ahead and put this guy back together. One thing that I like about the plastic uh, shock ends that are on the end of the shock shaft here, this being plastic, it means that the metal shock shaft isn't going to back out easily. A lot of the problem with uh, all aluminum shocks is these shock ends, you have to lock tight them. If you don't lock tight them, they always back out and then you end up having a shock pop off in the middle of a run. So the plastic is definitely nice in that regard because um, it tends to just kind of stay better. I'm just going to tuck that guy in there nicely. Let's get our shot collar back in. It's a shot collar. Wait, what? 20 inch blades on the Impala. I'm dating myself. Bam. Well, you know what? We might need a little bit more oil. Just a little. Just a drip. Good oil-filled shocks, if you if you overfill them too much, you kind of get this natural rebound. 
kind of okay with that. As long as we do them all the same, um, then you're good to go. All right. Nice. They're super smooth. These shocks are very nice. Even though they're plastic, uh, I don't think you can really judge a shock based on whether it's plastic or aluminum, you know. It's more about the components that make up the shock, the O-rings, the spacers, how they're doing, the, the valve spacer. Um, yeah, how smooth it feels. Just because it's uh, plastic does not mean it's not quality. Yeah, these are super good. I like it. All right, let's get it back together. I'll do the other side with some, some of this oil. That way, at least the rears are the exact same. Um, yeah. Just a reminder when you're, again, putting on your wheels and tires, these seem to be fine, but it may depend on the truck. Your truck might be a little different. Always when you're tightening down your wheel or your, your wheels onto your axles, make sure that there's freedom of movement in that wheel once you're fully tight. Sometimes the uh, hex hub will sit on the axle pin without pushing onto the bearing or the bushing or the axle itself. And sometimes they do push on the bearing or bushing and axle if you tighten them down too much. So these actually seem very good. So it didn't didn't seem to bind up at all. They're very tight. And you don't want to over tighten, but I tightened them down just to test quite a bit. And uh, they still are sitting there. There's no play side to side. Very good. Very good fitment. I am super happy with that. So that's awesome. Something else I wanted to show real quick. If you notice these shocks, they sit at like half droop, which is, in my opinion, an ideal setup because then you have travel both up and down about halfway of the total shock length. So from the box, these are set up already basically at half droop. What droop actually is, is when you lift up the axle or lift up the chassis, see how the axle stays down and you have that shock movement here, the, the travel? That's your droop. It's called droop because your axle is drooping down, right? So in racing, that's your droop distance. You have, you know, however many millimeters that moves when you, you're you sitting at a natural rest state, right? We'll go ahead and natural rest state, and then the amount of travel dropping down before you lift, that's your droop. And these guys are sitting right in between basically 50-50 which I really, really like that. That means they have a really good shock spring rate. Um, once the body's on there, it'll probably be a little bit more, like a 60% compressed, 40, you know, yeah, 60% compressed, 40% uncompressed, um, which is also very good. A lot of guys try to run what's called full droop, and basically what that means is you sit all the way down with no springs, and then when you lift up from the chassis, as you lift it, you're basically fully drooping. It drops the full amount because you're already fully compressed. So, and if you're, if you have zero droop, you're basically sitting where your sh springs are so stiff that you're up all the way, which you can push down, but then when you let go and its natural state is up and you lift up the chassis, that axle comes right up with it. That's basically zero droop. But this guy sits right at about maybe 40, 40%, 40, 60. So I dig that on a crawler. Uh, having a little bit more droop is good. So that means a little bit less downward travel. But you want a little bit because it allows better articulation, a uh, smoother articulation, and um, it allows you to keep some traction down. Having that little bit of spring, the whole point of springs is to keep traction down. So it'll help with that quite a bit, having that uh, a little bit of uh, like 40% of spring where you're not just fully compressed. Anyway, all right, let's get into the transmission. Now, before I pop this guy out, I just want to point out how clean this thing is assembled. I, I, I mean, I didn't even realize it at first, but you see no wires in here from the servo back. Like your servo goes tucked right in there and then it's clean all back under here. Talk about a clean installation. So your, your motor wire, and you probably can't see it because it's black, but it comes out right down here. It goes down and in between the chassis and the transmission right there super super clean for a box stock like that's attention to detail that a lot of um i'm not gonna do that what am i doing a lot of the uh bigger guys don't really they have you know when you're mass producing tons and tons of these trucks 
on an assembly line, there's only so much attention to detail you can really give. So, you know, I don't really expect that, but the fact that this $200 ready to run, $199 is brushless and as clean as it is, man, pretty nuts. You know, I'm not just trying to upsell it. Like I am genuinely impressed here. Um, I knew what was coming, but now that one's in my hands, I'm just like, man, like you, it's a no brainer. If you're looking for a brushless setup, you know, and you don't need tons of aftermarket because there's not a ton of aftermarket support. But again, there's going to be. And over time, it, there's just going to be more and more of it. And if you're creative and whatnot, there's so much stuff you can do with these without any aftermarket support at all. Um, and there will be more coming. So, um, but like if you're not looking for axial level where there's literally 30 companies doing every part, most of them are all the same parts anyway. Um, but man, what you get here is just bonkers. Um, all right, let's see. I've never actually taken one of these transmissions apart. Am I gonna am I gonna screw myself here? Looks like they. Uh, what is this? Are these just like grub screws? They just fill in the holes with grub screws. Looks like they might. All right, let's uh, get this guy apart here. Oh, I think I found my first first Phillips. Kind of to be expected, actually. So the only Phillips so far drive shaft you now I should have checked to see if these were in phase before I took it apart I bet you they were I bet you the drive shafts were in phase maybe I can go back and look at the video and see if they were in phase from the video I wasn't thinking about that usually from the factory they're definitely not um, but we always try to phase our drive shafts when we reassemble stuff. All right, drive shafts out. Let's see here. I guess we just pull out these screws here. Let's start with this guy here. And we've never done this one before. So just like you or a lot of you guys that are new, um, you just got to dive into it sometimes. Don't be afraid. Try to remember how you take things apart and how you put things so you can put things back together. Keep similar, you know, screws from similar areas all in one spot, or even put them in these little numbers so you know the order in which they came out. A lot of times it's a lot more surprising um, than not. Well, I guess it's not surprising. I don't know what I'm saying there. A lot of times uh, the screws are surprisingly all the same. So it doesn't really matter. You just put a screw in the screw hole and you're good to go. Sometimes they are different and you need to keep an eye out for those. But generally, there's a lot more screws that are common than uncommon. Okay, so is that it? Oh, that's it on this. Okay, boom. Let's pull this guy apart here. What do we have here, guys? Oh man, hold on, hold on. If you are ever worried about something not going back together the way you took it apart, take pictures or record yourself or you can reference a video like this. All right, so hold on, I wanna pull this guy apart. There we go, everything mashed together the way it should be. So it looks like, oh, what the hell? Did they, I think they actually have, hold on. Trying to figure out the two-speed deal here. Are we not spinning? What's going on here? Oh, this is not going to spin without the, uh, where is it? Okay, yeah, you need to have the shaft in there for this to stay engaged. So it looks like, do these just slide? I'm almost wondering if, 
how hard it, I'm trying to figure out how hard it would be or what's missing from the two speed. I just don't have enough experience with with this transmission in particular. It's interesting that there's like doubled up gears. Hmm. Hmm, I say. Can I pull the shaft out so I can actually see stuff working? There we go. All right, I don't want to spend too much time on this. You can always skip it, go to the chapters below. But this is interesting to me. All right, there we go. So there's gears that are not being engaged at all. Like, at all, at all. I think it's as simple as trying to get this to slide. But what's interesting is I think, let's see if that stays engaged there. This should be able to slide, but maybe because they put a pin in it, it will not or because it's on the wrong side, it will not engage. Like they just moved the gear to the other side of the pin. That's interesting. Or there's supposed to be a gear on here that slides. Man, I wish I knew more about this transmission in the Evo. We'll probably do a video later really covering that. Sorry guys. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and just throw this guy back together, but you can see all the gears are metal. These are the same size gear though. So, hmm, hmm, I see. Pretty beefy gears though. Man, I'm just so confused at how, is this not correct? Hold on, something's not right here. Please go the other way. Yeah, like nothing engages this gear right here or this gear right here. So it's almost like it's just missing maybe one more gear and a shift fork or something along those lines. I don't know. I don't know. We'll have to take apart the other one and compare. All right, let's go ahead and get this, this side back together. Or do we put this together and then we pull this part off? Yeah, we'll go ahead and get this together and then we'll pull the other side off. All right, I'll be back. I get it. Some of you guys might be like, why are you going through and just showing us this stuff or taking it apart? And I'll be honest, I've had a lot of people reach out and appreciate videos I've done where I've taken things apart like this just and just shown it, not upgraded or shown any tips or tricks, just showed how it was put together or taken apart um, just like I did. And so that they can reference that when they're working on theirs because, well, maybe they took theirs apart and didn't take pictures or a video. And so they searched up and were able to find a video where I took something apart and they can just see it so they can put it back together how it was supposed to go after they took it apart. Um, so that's part of the reason. Um, also, I like to just kind of dig in there and look at things. And there's a ton of grease in there because my hands are full of grease now. <laughs> well, that's a long screw, huh? I guess it's the same length. Again, a lot of them are the same size. So you don't have to stress about putting the right screw in the right hole. And bam. So again, metal spur gear here. That big old pinion. Look at that big old pinion in there. All right. Now I don't see any way to adjust the mesh. It looks like it just kind of goes on there how it goes on there. I think this is just a little motor mount right there. And then two screws for that. Pretty simple little setup there. 
Again, that's all that there is on this side, which is actually really nice. If you were to swap motors or need to change things out, you don't have to pull the whole transmission apart. You literally can just pull those four screws out and then the two on your motor mount and you're good to go. I dig that for sure. I do wish, and I, it's not expected, I do wish that these pinions were not press on. I wish they were a little grub screw. Now, most ready to runs obviously are gonna be press ons like that, but how cool would it have been to be a grub screw on there so you could just change out your pinion if you needed to, change your gear ratio with a different, uh, different, um, whoa, that's one piece. The spur gear is one piece. I was gonna say with a different spur, but you could even here, you know, if they made a different spur gear, um, you can make a smaller spur gear with a put a larger pinion on or a larger, maybe not, you probably can't do a larger spur gear. Uh, you're probably at your max there, but you could do maybe one tooth smaller pinion and be able to adjust it over. That would be pretty slick just from an adjustability and tunability standpoint. That would be nice. But this is uh, it's good how it is right now. I just know that people like to do craziness and having adjustability without having to fab up a bunch of stuff is always, always a plus. So yeah, from the two speed, we're definitely missing a shift rod here and a shift fork. And I think we're missing some gears. Like I said, maybe I'll do another video where I actually pull this guy all the way apart and pull the Evo transmission all the way apart and we can compare it. Um, if you ever did want to make this guy a two speed, which isn't really necessary with the brushless, but maybe you want to go super slow crawl with tons of torque and then uh, super fast like a monster truck. Um, then you can use a two speed, but it just takes up more room, more points of failure. Um, you have to have another channel on your transmitter. It's more weight. You have to have a place to mount the shift servo. There's reasons to not put a two speed in, especially if you're going to do a comp crawler. If you're doing a comp crawler, you don't need two speed. You don't want a two speed actually. Uh, you just want a nice, good, low gear, low center of gravity, low component build. And uh, yeah. It's all about efficiency in like a high-end comp rig. All right, guys, I babbled enough. I think we showed everything, showed, have shown. We have shown everything we wanted to show um, in this little guy. So yeah, oh no, where does this go? Oh no, guys. Well, looks like we'll be referencing our own video, BRB. A few moments later. All right, guys, after reviewing the replay, we had totally messed up the way this, this goes. This little bushing actually goes on the long side, and the long side is the side that drops in here like so. So these gears do match up just like this. Okay, so this is the correct way the transmission should be set up. Just make sure you reference this part of the video. Okay, there's a bushing in there. This little guy right there. Just like so. And then we can throw our housing cover back on and we will be good to go. Good thing we recorded. We would have had some weird weirdness going on. Probably would have had, I don't know, what would have happened if we would have left it? We were actually like this no bushing flipped and the gear was actually touching the gear in here and that would have changed our whole ratio oh <laughs> it would have been super fast like uber uber fast that would have been bad news hold on hold on i want to i want to see we're gonna see All right, so let's see if we can figure out a way to, uh, whoa, figure out a way to mark this guy or make it more obvious, more visible to what's happening. We stick, just stick a screw in here. Here, one of the drive shaft screws. Will that just, will it stay? It probably will. Here, we'll do this. All right, we're not going to go crazy fast, but basically, let's go ahead and turn our throttle trim up just enough to where it spins. All right. So just where it starts spinning, there we go. So I'm gonna actually take this guy apart while it's spinning. 
Not going to change anything. Let's pull our screw out here. Come on. Come on, screw. There we go. Put our bushy in and flip it this way. Oh man, look at the difference in speed. So yeah, if you really want to make it not so fast, I guess you could just flip the gears like that. It probably wouldn't be too good on the motor. I'll just tell you that right now. But who knows? <laughs> it would definitely be faster though. As you can see how slow that's going. Again, just to reference, flip this guy back around. Look at that. It's like three times faster almost. And it would fit. You could run it like that. I think. The shaft outputs are all the same, so that would be bonkers. All right, guys, <laughs> we'll put her back the way she's supposed to be. Interesting, interesting. I love stuff like that. So again, long side goes towards the motor with your little bushing. Throw her back in. There you go. So you actually have redundancy in your gears, so you'll probably never strip one of these gears ever all right we'll be back when it's all back together so one thing i want to point out when you're taking this part of the transmission apart you need to make sure that your bushings are nice and tight and that you don't over tighten your screws here um, let me i'll show you over tightened so these are pretty tight not so tight that they're going to strip but maybe my bushings aren't completely flush and you can you can feel the motor doesn't doesn't turn the best like it, it's got a little resistance, not much, but you can also hear it. Hear that? Versus if I back this off, back each screw off just a half turn, half turn, half turn. That's a lot more happy sounding. Okay. Might even be able to go a little more. Quarter turn. And you can feel it so just be aware of that make sure you don't just throw it together put the whole car together and then wonder why your motor burned up or your esc burned up you want to feel that stuff you want to test things as you're putting it back together make sure things are right um, because otherwise you're gonna have a bad day so i just wanted to point that out a lot of that's going to be like your bushings make sure your bushings are fitting and seated totally correctly um, I'm actually going to pull this guy apart and just double check, but I wanted to show you that because there was a lot of binding in there. And I'm pretty sure it's because one of my bushings is not fully seated. Or maybe I just way over tightened it. And I don't think I could have way, way over tightened it without potentially stripping something. Um, and I didn't strip anything, obviously. So my guess is the next bet is a bushing is not fully seated. More than likely, it's going to be, yep, this bushing here is my guess. So I'm going to go ahead and put them on this side. We're going to push them down in the in this little slat. Went in fairly easily, so maybe it was fully seated. We'll see. Make sure this is nice and tight. Oh, come on now. One of the other bushings came out, so we should be fine. And now it looks like it actually sits a little bit more flush. It was just a little less flush than I would have expected initially, just by putting it in by hand. Like you can just hit push it in and it's flush. Before it was a little less flush than that. So I think that's what it was. Just a bushing, not fully seated. But keep an eye out for that kind of stuff, guys, because you never know. And if, like I said, if you go and put the whole thing together, you run the rig and it seems like it's running okay, but your motor's overheating or 
thing, weird things are happening, it could potentially be something as simple as that. So that's why I always say check along the way. Now we're nice and snug, nice and snug. Let's get our last guy in there. Nice and snug. Uh, still a little resistance. Could be our drag break. Let's go ahead and back it off just a little. Back it off just a little. We're just going to do a quarter turn here. Quarter turn here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Way better. All right. So yeah, combination of a bushing not all the way seated and a little little too tight on the, the housing will definitely cause binding and in turn a burned up motor or ESC. All right, we're gonna get this guy back in there and we're good to go. Sorry that was so long. Like I said, guys, um, my review video, I kind of pride myself on review videos that are deeper dive, long form, helps out the new guys um, or people that have never done, you know, taken one apart or that are scared to take one apart. Hopefully I make you feel a little more comfortable and um that's kind of the key right that's the whole reason i started the channel i want people to feel comfortable taking their trucks apart all right so i just wanted to see how this fit before we put our drive shafts back in yeah interesting mounting point here i wonder if that's from the original chassis and the servo i wonder if the servo mount mounts to that um, all right go ahead and get our drive shafts in make sure you phase them Remember, phasing is lining up the ears. This is a good example. We'll just do it here. This is phased. See how your ears line up? This is out of phase. See how the ears do not line up? They're opposites, right? You want it like this. That helps prevent vibration at higher speeds. Not the most important on a uh, really slow crawler, but at higher speeds it'll vibrate and actually it can also help prevent binding at extreme articulation so we're gonna go ahead and get this back together we'll be back one thing i want to point out about the drive shafts there are two output shafts for the rear if you attach it to the wrong one which would be this side here you want it to be on the same side this side actually spins opposite of that side so you'll sit there and go nowhere if you hook it to that so you're going to definitely want to put your drive your rear drive shaft on the same side as your front drive shaft. Um, this output shaft, I don't even know what this is used for. I mean, you could use it for like, so in real life, there's when there's an extra output shaft like that, it's generally for like um, farm tools. So you like have a lawnmower that attaches as, like a trailer to the back of the truck and that's what spins the blade on the lawnmower or a tiller, or stuff like that. That's usually what that output shaft is for. Um, maybe you could be creative and put a boat propeller on there and make it a, Amph Amphicar or something, I don't know. Um, but definitely make sure you attach it to the correct drive shaft or you're going to go nowhere. Let's see if I can get this on without having to pull it all apart. Let's see. Flat side is up. So we should be good to just drop this guy on there. There we go. Oh no, we missed. There we go. Just got to make sure you're lined up properly with the flat side of the output shaft and the flat side of your drive shaft uh, end here. And then you're good to go. Again, don't over tighten. I always say it because again, I don't know who's watching. Newbie or veteran experienced, been doing it for 30 years guy. So I just try to make sure that if it's somebody's first time seeing one of my videos or seeing a video on the truck, they know all the basics as well. One of the things about my reviews, like I said, I pride myself on trying to dive deep. A lot of the guys, no hate against anybody else that reviews uh, trucks that get sent out to them, um, which by the way, of course, this was sent to me by FuraTech. I did not pay for this, just disclosing that. Um, but I don't let that bias me. I mean, if there's something I don't like about a truck that's sent to me, I'm going to say it. And I tell those people, and if they can't deal with that, then too bad, guys. Uh, don't send me your truck if it's a piece of junk because I will tell you uh, the, all the things I hate about it. I am very critical. Anybody that knows me knows that I will criticize anything and everything to anybody. I don't care who it is. Um, <laughs> I even, I, uh, 
I made a video about a specific brand and at a big event, I was talking to somebody and they're like, wait, are you Ken from the Shop Mini RC? I'm like, yeah. He's like, oh, oh yeah, you totally ripped me a new one uh, for my design on this truck. And it was a big company. Let's just say it started with like an A or a, a T or an F. Yeah, one of the big, the big, big companies. And um, yeah, they uh, basically were like, man, you criticized the hell out of that. But your points were valid and we took them into consideration, which made me feel really good. You know, I try not to just talk crap for the sake of talking crap. I like to, I want to I give feedback, um, hoping to improve the designs. And I understand there's a lot that goes into some of those designs. And actually in that conversation with that designer for that company, he explained why some of the stuff that I criticized was the way it was. And they wanted to change some of those things, but just given time constraints, budget constraints, and, you know, there's like empirical or historical, it's almost like tech debt. When they design something, as they go through iterative processes of designing things, things end up staying a certain way because, well, that's how it was from the beginning, even though things have changed and they just can't go back and change molds or whatever to make something a little bit better. It's like, it's a game of percentages, right? Like if you are 80% of the way there, that extra 20%, sometimes you just can't get it out um, without costing 80% more and you want to reduce the cost. So you're just like, you got to iterate your, your designs until they get to a point And then you just kind of, you know, there's issues, but you just leave them. You have to. So, um, yeah. And we talked a lot about that. So, um, any sort of criticism, I, can't, I keep pointing at these because I'm talking about this chassis design here that I would change. Now, I don't know why, um, they didn't consider changing this. Um, like I said, the, uh, it could have had to do with just the, the link here, or I don't know. I haven't talked to Gammy specifically on why they didn't change that, but like I said, um, the criticism from the other gentleman, or that I gave to the other gentleman's vehicle that he had built, when I was talking to him, I didn't even know who he was. And yeah, after he's like, oh yeah, I was the lead designer on that, that truck. Um, so I was like, oh man, I was kind of embarrassed, but then after the conversation got going, um, he wasn't offended. He understood. And we came to a really good common ground. And now we are, uh, we talk. So that's pretty awesome. Um, anyway. All right, guys, uh, we're all put back together. We're good to go here. And um, yeah, I just wanted to show you deep dive. You can always skip parts you don't like. We always put chapters down below. All the other, um, you know, some, some of the YouTube channels out there, like I said, when they get a truck, where I was going with that was, when they get a truck, they just review it. They're like, here's the truck. Look at all the stuff, parts. Here you go. Plug it in, drive it. Um, cool drive. We think it's good or we think it's bad. I like to try to just I try to be objective. Everything I say is my opinion. And um, I like to go a little bit deeper. That's kind of my thing. Anyway, we're going to get this guy back together. We're going to get it to ProLine by the fire. We're going to drive it at ProLine. And uh, yeah, we're excited.
right guys, just drove this guy out on the little course. So fun. So many comments from people like, everybody's like, is that the new Fear Tech? Yes, sir. Showed him the slow crawl, showed him just kind of how it's all metal drivetrain. Everything's metal in it as far as the, the drivetrain's concerned. Metal axles, metal gears in the diff, metal gears in the portal, metal gears in the transmission. Um, anyway, guys, hope you enjoyed that crawler footage. I'll, uh, I'll wrap this up when I get home tomorrow. Peace. Well, we just got back from Proline and it was awesome. It was really hot and way drier than I expected. I mean, I'm in Colorado and I get dryness, but like, man, it was, it was dry there and hot and dusty. I and mean, look how dirty this guy is. Look at that, full of dirt. We even tried to wipe it off a little bit. <laughs> anyway, guys, this thing is awesome. Um, we demoed it all weekend. We used my truck as the demo truck. We had a couple other city on the table, but mine was already opened and put together and ready to run. So we just ran it. And um, it did great, guys. It did fantastic. Um, some things I want to point out. The ESC is 3S capable. The motor is supposed to also be 3S capable, but we noticed it getting pretty hot. I also had one customer that had an issue when they ran 3S um, and they smoked the motor. So just I want, want you guys to be aware if you try to run 3S, do so at your own risk, guys. Um, I don't know if it's labeled anywhere in the documentation that it's 3S capable, but I know that the ESC is, and I had heard that the motor is just, you can't, you can't run it hard uh, and get it overly hot. Another thing to definitely keep an eye out for in the app, if you're in there playing around, I think there's a bug right now, uh, not just for, you know, this ESC, but a couple different settings and whatnot that'll change your motor type from like the Venom to the Micro Komodo or to the Big Komodo or even your Cedar to a Micro Komodo. And if that happens, then it, the motor's going to not run right and it could be underpowered or overpowered. So just keep an eye out on the motor uh, selection in the app if you go in there and mess around. Out of the box, you shouldn't have that issue at all because it's going to be set to the Venom. Uh, but if you go in the app and make any sort of changes, definitely keep an eye out because I think there's a little bug in the app right now that will switch it um, inadvertently, even if you don't go in to switch the motor. So keep an eye out there. Um, anyway, other than uh, those few small things to keep a, a lookout on, uh, this thing is amazing, guys. We ran it all through that trail. I hope you guys enjoyed that trail, the uh, Micro Crawler Club out of uh, Utah van and those guys did a amazing job with that course. It was definitely a highlight of Proline by the Fire. So I was glad I was able to show you guys that uh, course in our running video with this little guy here. Uh, got a lot of looks, got a lot of attention. I mean, we sold the heck out of them at the booth. Um, everybody that came over and looked at them was just in awe at the value. You know, we'd pull the top off and show them the motor running and how slow it is and just all the amazing features that come with it. You know, all metal drivetrain except the drive shafts, uh, the chassis, the the oil-filled shocks. I mean, I can't say enough about it. It's for the... <laughs> For the price this thing is a value for sure um and it's just fun it's fun to be able to have that wheel speed and that slow crawl anyway guys i don't know what else to say about it this is a long long video and i apologize but we're going to do some upgrades to this i know that there's already some steering link upgrades and some suspension link upgrades that are metal so keep an eye out for those hopefully we can get some in soon and get another video just installing them to show you get you a link to uh the product so you can order some as well but check out all the normal retailers you know check out feartech.com or feartech usa or uh like even heli direct FairRC probably has some stuff because it's based on the CR18 platform and FairRC does a lot of Hobby Plus stuff. So check out all those guys and yeah, get out there, build something awesome. Pick one of these up, turn it into a crazy cool crawler, lower it, whatever. Why don't you put in the comments below what you're going to do with yours and maybe what color you want or what color you got. Seemed like the black with flames and the green were the most popular. Kind of thought the red would do well, but it is what it is. Get out there, build something awesome, build a car, build a course, build a community, and then smash it, crash it, and bash it, but don't break the expensive parts. Until next time, guys.